And in fact, I'd like to start out with introductions. If you would uh, introduce yourself, Sean, and tell them about what you do here. Excellent. Well, my name is Sean Wilson. I'm a small business development counselor over at UVU. And I also work here out of the Eagle Mountain. Should I back up from that camera, Connie? <laughs> <laughs> at the Eagle Mountain Business Resource Center. So I kind of have like a, a little bit of a hybrid position. So I work out at UVU and counsel with small businesses out there. And Econi was so great, gracious to bring me on uh, about a year ago, actually, as a small business development counselor out here to meet with local businesses out here in Eagle Mountain. And uh, part of my duties out here is to manage and run the incubator program out here. And in the audience, we have a few incubator uh, incubies, I like to call them. <laughs> They'll announce themselves here shortly. But my primary function out here is to really help businesses grow. Uh, whether you're starting a business or trying to grow a business, that's what I'm here to help you do. And uh, you know, part of my mission as well is to help people, well obviously with economic development, help the local city create jobs. And if we're helping you grow your businesses and you hire people and it just becomes a, a beautiful little uh, um, organism of economic development. So that's kind of what I do out here. And if you have any questions about the incubator program, you have a business that you think might fit our program, give me, just talk to me afterwards and we can figure out if that might be a fit for you. Or if you're looking to grow your business or start a business, Come talk to me, and we can get you on my calendar, and we can we can help you do those things. So that's why. I'm here. Hey, thank you, Sean. Hey, Connie, would you uh, introduce yourself? Um, and come on up, or we can get you. <coughs> you know, Hi, yeah, no, this will just be this will just won't won't take long. Hey, Connie, I work for the city Eagle Mountain Economic Development, and um, I'm here with full support from the mayor, city council, as we strongly believe in uh, small businesses and local businesses. So we appreciate all your efforts and your entrance and, and your investment definitely in local business and supporting uh, local commerce. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Sean. How are you coming? Appreciate it. Well, let's go ahead and have each of you introduce yourselves and uh, just take 30 seconds to tell us who, your name and your business. <coughs> okay. I'm Brandon Bear. We are with Disaster Professionals. We do flood, fire, mold, natural disaster, cleanup, and restoration. So we're in the incubator program. This is most of our space, just actually right outside here. So. Thank you. Um, I'm Brian Bills. I, along with my wife, we are in the incubator business as, or incubator office space as well. Um, <coughs> we're just right upstairs. I represent mostly BNL online promotions, my own marketing consulting company. Um, I deal with anything online, business plans, stuff like that. And Lindsay, the other half. Um, <laughs> I. We'll play a little dress-up shop. We're upstairs, part of an incubator program. We sell kids' um, princess clothes and boys' pretend play costumes online and out of the space upstairs. I'm Darren Gillespie. I'm a therapist. I just opened a private practice out here in the next building over. And um, it's my first meeting. And just, so I just started this this summer, so I want to learn how to do the business side of Great. Uh, Rich Black, I've just been in the city for about 13 years, been a business owner, live, live in the city and I have a couple of different businesses, I have a contracting business and I have an auto qual, which is, uh, we do interior restoration. Glad to have you here. Matthew Chase, uh, Utah Preparation, we're primarily a teaching consulting company that helps you deal with any and every kind of emergency. My name is Chris Kiefer. I'm with Chase Bank. I'm the business specialist over there, so I help business owners from beginning to growing or expanding in any kind of business need. So I'm just here to support. Great. I'm Lindsay Barnard. I'm also a therapist, um, and my partner is going to be here shortly. He's running late. Um, we do sexual addiction treatment. Um, we're trying to break into Eagle Mountain right now. We're based in Lehigh, so we kind of wanted to come and support. And I live here, so that's probably the reason we wanted to kind of establish ourselves out here. Awesome. Glad to have you. Uh, I'm Nick Barnard. Um, I'm an OBHR student at Birmingham University, so just doing networking and kind of seeing what I can do to get involved in the city. But I don't necessarily own or operate any businesses right now. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> My name is Scott Pim. I specialize in social media and video marketing. Uh, what I do is I help companies establish a YouTube brand and also help them establish a iconic nature so that we can do all their marketing and their tags and everything that needs to be done in their YouTube channel. We do all the filming and editing outsource. 
Um, I work with people like Devin Supertramp and Lindsey Sterling, so we do have some pretty good clients that we've done work for. And we do all the video production work and video marketing. My name is Scott, thanks. Uh, Nate Furman with Utah Preparation that kind of already introduced who we are. So. <laughs> Janelle Furman, Utah Preparation. He also forgot HPC integrators. Um, he does high performance computing on Linux supercomputers also. Um, but we do not just the, the training and consulting, but we for, for any kind of emergency, but we sell um, products and we have um, for emergency preparedness and we've developed a, um, a module um, based um, program for your 72 hour kit um, that, that we're very excited to, to begin um, rolling out and, and presenting in our classes. Awesome. Great. So the late cameras, who are you? <laughs> My name is Mike Lyman, and uh, sorry I'm late. Um, I've started a business back in March, um, engineer uh, recruiting, contracting business. Uh, I've started out in engineering, would place engineers in in a contractual basis, different different clients. Um, and then I, we just started a medical division, so we placed doctors on temporary assignments uh, throughout the United States. It's called Locum Tenens, and I've uh, been doing that since about August, July, August. So. Okay, next. Uh, for the Logics, we purchased the local newspaper last month, the Crossroads Journal. Our condolences. <laughs> 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 and well wishes. And glad to have you here. Peace. We have Paul Lytle. Uh, my name is Paul Lytle. I've got a little five attorney law firm in Lehigh, but I live in Eagle Mountain and uh, I'm proud to be helping these guys out in any way possible. If you do need any advice or uh, time for a consult, just let me know or let Sean know and I'll sit down with you for free. And, We'll talk about any issue you may have and try to address it the, the best way we know how. So, thanks for your time. Great. Do you have anyone coming in? Or introduce yourself. Steve, there's two seats over here. Oh, okay. Excellent. Okay. Did you want to give a word? Or? Okay. All right. Okay. Let's get on with the program then, and we're glad to have a very special guest with us here today. Oh, by the way, my name is Lamont Snar. And uh, at Star Media LLC, I do web development for building material supply companies, none of them in Utah. And a uh, company called Chamber Services LLC, where it's all the Chambers of Commerce. But with that, let's uh, get on to it. Welcome to our very special guest. And say your last name for me again. Jean Fro. Jean Fro. Winthrop? It's not easy. John, John Fro. That's right. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just read a quick bio here. Uh, uh, Mr. Winthrop John Fro has extensive experience successfully guiding emerging and rapid growth companies. Currently, Mr. John Fro is the director of the Small Business Development Center, often referred to as SBDC, at the Orem campus of Utah Valley University. As director, Winthrop is responsible for strengthening Utah's economic fabric and quality of life by facilitating the success and prosperity of all business endeavors in Utah Valley. For that end, Mr. John Fro has developed a set of core competencies that are taught to business owners in classroom settings as well as one-on-one -on -one through his staff of gifted and experienced business counselors, such as Sean. Right. Okay. All right. So let's welcome uh, Winthrop. Thank you. Glad to be here. Just one matter of business. Is anyone opposed to having video and we, we traditionally post these online on the on the city website is anyone that be objected to that uh, have an objection okay. and, and while, while we're doing that could you get out your phone to make sure they're on vibrate we'll just pretend like the world doesn't exist outside yeah. this room for for an hour or not quite an hour um so that that uh, although flattering introduction really doesn't tell you much about what i do 
Uh, I'm the director of the Small Business Development Center, but my background is like yours. I spent 30 years starting and selling businesses, and after eight of them, and it was kind of a cycle of, of taking everything I had and investing in one, and then you know, having absolutely nothing to eat, and then having opulence, and then investing that opulence in the next one, having nothing to eat, and growing it bigger. After, after eight cycles of that, uh, in 2008, I sold my last business and thought I retired. And then I found out in November of last year that semi-retirement was a virtue for me, but not my wife. And it was last year, November, that she said, by the way, when I found a job for you and I applied online. I said, really, what's that job? And she said, the director of the Small Business Development Center. And I'd never heard of the SBDC. I, I did, you know, 30 years in, in private practice. I only knew of the SBA, and they were useless. You know, what does the government know about small business? Uh, and I applied for a bunch of this, you know, four times SBA loans, got two qualified, and then uh, found cheaper money with less strings, you know, back in the day when they actually wrote you know, underwrote loans. And so I, I read the description and, and it seemed like it was right up my alley because I had spent the last 15 of the 30 years answering questions of friends of mine that were starting businesses that would come to me and say, when, you know, how do I organize? What, what form do I organize under? Do I do S Corp, C Corp, partnership, LLC, what? And after a while I would write it up instead of have to explain it. And that became this curriculum that really is developed from that place that many of you, if you're, if you're the owner of the business, you know viscerally what it's like when payroll's coming or when you've got an order you've got to pay for. I was just talking to Brian and, 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 his, and his wife, and, and we were talking about the fact that a growing business is a terrifying experience. Um, I had a, one of my businesses went from 11% growth to 27% growth compounded annually for six years, which means that every just under three years we were doubling in size, and we, and we had uh, the need to buy inventory for future growth and our inventory turns were slower than our need to purchase and so it was very very difficult I mean my first million dollars earned had brackets around it I remember my accountant called me and said you're a millionaire and I was like what he said yeah in debt and I was I was really it was it was sobering now fortunately the debt wasn't consumer debt it was leverage debt to you know that was invested in property plant equipment that ultimately for every dollar Borrowed, produced a dollar twenty-five or a dollar fifty or two dollars worth of value, and and that fortunately shifted, it, it, you know, not many years after. But I remember many, many nights, um, you know, wondering, you know, how am I going to increase revenue? How am I going to get the access to the capital that I need to grow my business? And so when I became the director of the Small Business Development Center, the first question I asked was, what's our core curriculum? You know, what are we going to teach? And we have this hodgepodge of stuff. And you know, Sean's a rare bird in our network. Sean's actually run a business, and and has that DNA, you know, that, that, that free enterprise DNA in his system. But but as a network, nationwide, you know, our, our, the director of our of our network, for example, terrific individual, has never had a job in the private sector. So going to the SBDC historically for counsel around how to grow revenue and gain access to counsel was a lot like my youth experience in you know my Catholic upbringing. You know, going to the priest asking for parenting advice or account, you know, marriage counseling. What do they really know about either of those topics, having not done either? And so the benefit that we enjoy in the valley, at least here, is that the staff that that <coughs> serves you, and we do serve you, um, is is really coming from the place of where you you are and where you're going. And we still keep our fingers in in our own enterprises. I still have businesses in Oregon that I'm involved in so that I remain frosty around the topics that matter. But what I want to talk about tonight, what I've asked to, to talk about tonight, is, um, is seven ways that you can put yourself out of business quickly. <laughs> and and uh, anybody here familiar by raise of hands uh, uh, with the Darwin Awards? So for those that don't know, what are the Darwin Awards? There are people who have been so stupid they've removed themselves from the gene pool. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and they've done it in such a spectacularly stupid way that they get an award, and, uh, and, and they're really kind of funny to, to read. I, I'm a pilot, uh, you know, it, it, to relieve stress, and, um, and I, I read, you know, there, there's a section in a couple of magazines that I read that show me, you know, accident reports for, for, for uh, you may be familiar. So you read those because you think, yeah, I'll never do that, but then I've had enough experiences in a small plane to realize, you know, I'm just one moment away from a Darwin Award. Um, but in small business, it feels like you are in an airplane. It's interesting. If you, how many here have flown in small airplanes? Okay. 
there's something that occurs in a small airplane that is different than in a commercial airplane. Your heart begins to beat to the rhythm of the, of the, of the engine. And when the engine skips a beat, so does your heart. And, uh, and on long distance trips, I've not always been really elegant in my shifting from one tank to another. You know, I'm like trying to squeeze the mo most amount of fuel out. And I found out that, that uh, the best pilot is not necessarily the one that can demonstrate loops and rolls. It's the pilot that makes his, cl that makes his passengers the most comfortable. And by that standard, you, you want to switch your tank before you're totally empty. Because I've had more than one, one, one passenger um, experience a, a moment where it becomes really difficult from a scent standpoint uh, when the engine stops for just a few minutes while you're switching to a different tank. Uh, but we have those experiences like that where you think you're near death when you're, when you're operating a small business. And I can tell from the look in many of your eyes whether you're, you're offering therapy on six, sexual addiction. Is that what you... I'm told we don't have sexual addiction problems or drinking problems in this valley. I'm new to the valley. I'm new. I'm came from Oregon. I was told and my, my sister and brother-in-law came here to celebrate Thanksgiving. It happens to be the the, cel the anniversary of their 11th year of sobriety, and so we went. We looked for an NA meeting. It was very difficult to find because we were told there's we don't have that problem in the valley. Although we finally found one. I give you a whole list. Yeah, they got the token. It was great. But it kind of feels like that in a meeting, hi, I'm Wynn and I own a small business. And it, it's like an addiction because there's this wonderful, um, it, it's almost like the promise of a future that you haven't yet realized. I mean, how many here have made so much money in their business that you don't have to work anymore? Or how many have made so much money in their business that they don't worry about the next payroll? Or that they don't worry about the next big order that they got to place? and hope that they sell through what they have so they can pay the bill when it comes due. I mean, none of us are in that place. And, and for those that, that make it there, you'll find that you want to be back in that miserable, wonderful place where, you're, where your throat's tight and your hands are sweaty and it's, there's nothing like it. And it is a bit like an addiction because there is nothing in life um, that's legal that is as close to, uh, you know, to, to the other illegal activities that give you that same kind of buzz. As, as running a small business. But what I've prepared is, I know there are lots of ways to do a business, so this is not the definitive work on the topic, but uh, let me go ahead and I want you to take one and pass it off. Thank you. Um, as, as was mentioned in the brief introduction, what, what we have, what we are using at the ORMS BDC is what I call the Business Essentials Training. And the Business Essentials Training is a curriculum that, again, comes from that place of having to solve important issues with the businesses that I own. And what I what I discovered is that, you know, I, I started, for example, the Shreddit franchise. Anybody here familiar with Shreddit? Big trucks go online, you know, go sh show up and destroy. Anyway, so it's mobile mobile confidential waste destruction. And, um, and we, we started in Oregon, Southwest Washington, and my partner and I, we were the fa of the hundred offices in, in the world, we were the fastest growing, most profitable. And what was interesting is, is that, um, among other things, you think that, that what, what made Shreddit successful might have made our distribution company successful. And what made our distribution company successful, you would hope would make um, you know, the, an audio company that I started successful. What we found is that it didn't matter whether it was shredding paper or selling speakers or wholesaling uh, consumables, that any business to succeed has common elements, and the common elements are this. Whether you were providing counseling or disaster cleanup or none of you are wearing labels that I can easily, and I, and, or selling banking services, you are and we are, <coughs> as the SBDC, primarily in the business of marketing. And if you don't realize that you're in the business of marketing, you'll be put out of business by somebody in your space that knows it better than you do. And the other, the, the, have, I, 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 because I'm in the audio business, I love movie references. Is anybody here not familiar with the original Karate Kid? The wax on and wax off? Okay, great. I was realizing some of my references. You know, I get these glassy eyes around 25-year-olds where they go, I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> so, so the wax on of, of business is truly understanding that you were first in the business of marketing. Now, let me explain what that is because people get nervous when I say you're in the business of marketing. They think you've got to go out and sell like a, like a used car salesman. I've got to convince somebody to buy my goods or I'm going to go out of business. That's not marketing. 
we'll discuss what that is. But we are first and foremost marketers. And then second, we need to understand our numbers. We need to understand how we make money, where our margins come from, and whether or not we're making a profit with every transaction. Because if you are making a profit with every transaction, you can't make it up in volume. And so if you don't understand how you make your money, you'll put yourself out of business. And small business owners, all, most of the sins that we commit fall under one of those two broad categories. We either don't market well, or we don't understand how we make money. And so I have a little handout for you. And the handout really is talking about seven of the primary ways that we put ourselves out of business. And they are, the, the, the icon is, again, a reference to part of the curriculum that we teach and that we use in our counseling for businesses in the Valley. And Sean will be using this, and we use it in ORM currently. But the first, the first one I call plant your flag, where people simply go out of business is that they stop solving a meaningful problem or they start a business without a problem in mind that they want to solve. If you are, have a business that you're not solving a problem with, you have a hobby. Successful businesses are those that solve big problems. You want a big business? Find a big problem. Find a solution to it. You want a small business? Find a small problem. Provide a solution to it. But you'll go out of business if you stop solving the problem. The plant your flag piece is you've got to do three things in that space. You've got to identify what problem you're going to solve, you've got to solve it uniquely, and then you have to determine what your value proposition is. A value proposition is not just a measure of what the price is that you're going to charge, but it's the total value to the recipient whose problem you're solving. And over time, the problem that you may have set your business up to solve gets solved more elegantly through technology, or it goes away, or whatever. Uh, you know, you look at a variety of different com companies like Kodak. You know, Kodak thought that it was in the film business. It was, it ha had Kodak understood their purpose, which was to capture memories, not sell film. They would have adopted mo much more readily as a culture the change to digital media. In fact, they were one of the first producers of the digital camera, but they didn't embrace it because it threatened their sacred cow of film. And again, their definition of what they were doing, the, the problem they were solving, they thought the problem was selling, selling film. And the problem they really were solving was capturing memories. And so what problem are you solving? How are you solving it uniquely? And what's the value proposition? And so the fun part of that Rubik's Cube is translating your activity into a value that you can share with the person that has the problem, and it becomes self-evident. An example of that is, let's say, for example, you broke your arm. You know, I come to you and say, your arm's broken? You say, yes. I go, I moved to you and I go, does it hurt if I do this? And immediately, you know, you kind of, yeah, it hurts. Would it hurt if I lifted it up? Well, I'm, t I'm doing basic marketing, identify the problem, amplify the problem. Now I hold up something that looks an awful lot like a sling. I say, do you think this would help? There's a self-evident recognition that what I'm offering him might solve the problem. It has this padded shoulder thing, it wraps around it, and it's bright color so people can see that you have a broken arm. And you go, great, I'll take it. Then the last part is the value proposition. Is your pain greater than my price? And if it's not, we don't have a transaction. If it does, you know, give me two. And if you're a woman, what color does it come in? Does it come in other than blue? So th that's, those are the basics. But that's, if you don't understand that, if you aren't solving a problem, you'll go out of business, or your business won't thrive. And the more acute the problem, the narrower the, the, prob the solution that you offer, the more successful you'll be, which is also counterintuitive. Most people think, well, geez, if I specialize, I, I cut all these people out as potential buyers. The real courageous awakening for your success is the day you realize not everybody out there is your client. In fact, most of them aren't. And when you understand that, then you get really clear about how to address that, that group. So then the next part for, for going out of business, and I thought we were going to do 45 minutes. They said, I've got to be done in 22. Still got half an hour. Oh, half an hour. <clears throat> okay. The next one here is believing that everybody's your client, as I mentioned before. Now, the sales funnel's there because once you've planted your flag and get really clear about the solution, you get really clear about who your audience is. And so if you believe everybody is, your, is, is indeed your customer, you spend precious resources, and cash is the lifeblood to every business. You spend precious resources marketing where people are not. 
And one of the one of the other symbols we use to to uh, demonstrate that principle is a tuning fork. How many here play other than the stereo? Anybody here musicians? Okay, so, so what's a tuning fork? It's what you use to tune your instrument. Okay, now they're electronic, but but typically you hit it and you right. can tune your instrument. Right, you get an entire set, and then all the notes of the key, and you and you hit it. And if if I were to walk in a room with a set of tuning forks, and I hit the C note, only the C note tuning forks in the room would resonate with that harmonic, with that with that with that vibration. And that's a terrific analogy about finding really clearly what your message is to the problem you're solving and striking it where there are mi as many people that will resonate with that particular message as you can find. And when you get really clear about the problem you're solving, you get really clear about who your client is, and then you get really clear about where to go and how to spend your money marketing. Uh, back to the example of, of this gentleman's broken arm. Now, we know that there are tons of people already selling slings, right? So how do we differentiate ourselves in that market if there are tons of medical suppliers that sell slings that have the shoulder thing and the little, you know, fake wool and wraps around it, blue, red, green, whatever. How do we differentiate ourselves? Can we differentiate ourselves on the strap or on the waistband or on the fact that it holds your arm? It's a good time to you know this is where we collectively yeah. say no. Right? So Scott, how can you How about like a video to explain how it works? How many times you get something you don't know how to use it? But how? I, I think a video is fine, but you do video, so I'd expect yeah. that to be a solution. You push quality, you push price, you push something that you feel is your strong asset. Yeah. So you push something that's unique. Now, there, for those that have done any reading in the in the field of marketing. There are a couple of authors that, that kind of flood the market. One of them is Jack Trout. And Jack Trout wrote a bunch of books, and one of them that, that is very, very popular is called Differentiate or Die. Don't buy the book. The title tells you everything you need. <laughs> so, <laughs> Differentiate or Die. So how do we differentiate ourselves in this market? There was a really powerful study that was done by an auto company. And let me just get to the statistics quickly. How many, what is the safest car on, on the road currently by feature? Volvo. 72% of Americans believe Volvo is the safest car on the road. How many here agree? So there was a company that decided that they wanted to own that space. And this company happened to have the convenience of being the one company that had developed the airbag, the side impact airbag, the crush zones, internal roll cage, anti-lock brakes, and the shoulder harness. You'd think that company was the safest car on, that, that built all that was the safest on the road. But Volvo owned that space. So this company spent $100 million in a worldwide campaign in the late 90s to convince us that Mercedes was the safest car on the road. And they ranked seventh prior to spending $100 million. Volvo ranked number one. After spending $100 million explaining that they had invented everything that made a car safe, they ranked number seven and Volvo ranked number one. And what we learned was that you can't change perception. Perception is reality. And you can't spend enough money to change people's minds. So if you're going to plant your flag and you're going to look for a solution and we're going to somehow differentiate ourselves with this, with this sling that I want to sell you, then I have to sell it for other than things that other people are already doing. The, the other example of that is, is toothpaste. What is toothpaste's primary purpose? Cavity prevention. Yeah, cavity control. <clears throat> Decay prevention. But what does AIM or, or, or Aquafresh, what does Aquafresh do for you? Fresh, Fresh breath. breath. Who owns cavities? Colgate. Crest owns water teeth. Aquafresh is fresher breath. Why? Because somebody already owns cavity control. And so if you're going to sell toothpaste, you can't fight cavities with your toothpaste. You've got to do something else. So what we might do with our sling is we might decide that how we're going to differentiate is we're going to make this a badge of honor. That people that break their arms are living their life on the edge. And there's going to be a token of that kind of lifestyle. And so we're going to brand this thing. We're going to visually create a brand around people that live their life on the edge. Now, it's not about being stupid. It's about living life so fully that you occasionally break yourself in the process. And that's the message. Now, who is going to resonate with that message? Is it your 50-year-old 
Uh, in, very tail end baby boomer? No, because I know that's really dumb for me to be going doing things that break my bones. So, but my 22 year old son is going to love that message. And if you put skulls and crossbones on it or you do something else that makes it kind of fashionable, it becomes a, you know, a way of selling. Now, what I've done is I've narrowed my market tremendously because there are a lot of baby boomers out there, right? 79 million of us, or 78, however quickly we're dying. <laughs> so I've eliminated you know, a good section of the population, but how many echo boomers are there? <clears throat> About 60 million, is that right? Is that a regular count? Or is it 80 million? And where will they be hanging out? Where do I advertise with my precious dollars? Now, when I, when I frame the question like that, suddenly you will become an expert in marketing. Where do you go to advertise? Online. Online? What events would you go and advertise at? Sporting. Exactly. You go to the skate parks, you go to the you know, extreme sport events, you go hang up a banner at the ski resort, you, you, know, you get involved with those companies where kids break their arms and break their legs, right? But if it's a sling, it's arm breaking only. And that's how you differentiate. Say again? Or collarbone. <laughs> right, or collarbone, whatever it happens to be. But when, when you begin to frame the solution that you're solving and you understand the need to differentiate, you then give yourself powerful tools that even neophytes like us can become experts in the field of marketing to understand where we go with our message, what <clears throat> message we're hitting, and, and you know, where are we going to find the most people that will resonate with it. And people that don't do that go out of business quickly because they believe everybody is their market. The next item is no margin, no mission. Back to what I said initially. You can't, if you're losing money on each transaction, you can't make it up in volume. In fact, it just exacerbates the problem. And so what I have down here is a very, very iconic uh, um, symbol for a Performa spreadsheet. Now, does anybody here know what a Performa spreadsheet is? How about profit and loss statement? Income statement, yeah, those are traditional accounting reports you can get and you can print them off quick in or QuickBooks. A performance is simply a forecast of income and expenses over a period of time because one of the biggest mistakes that small business owners make is they mistake income for profit. And at the end of a great month like, like December, you're going to have a terrific month and you can look at the bottom line and say, wow, $30,000 of positive free cash flow. Woohoo! Where's that truck we want to get? Forgetting that in April, May, June, July, nobody buys dresses. <laughs> and come, you know, September, you know, somewhere around July, August, you've got to place your Christmas order. And that $30,000 you blew on a truck would have really come in handy as a down payment on the next container of, of you know, product. And so understanding that, that margin, first you have to be making a profit beyond the inefficiency of your business. Now, one of the things that they didn't teach me in my undergrad, they didn't teach me in my graduate uh, studies, and that I only learned over many years of running businesses, is that there's a certain amount of inefficiency built into any business that is like the unemployment number. It never gets to zero. We consider uh, you know, our economy healthy at like around 7% unemployment because it, you know, a healthy economy isn't going to get us to zero. And likewise, a healthy business has an inefficiency that we can't totally manage out. Over time, we can get better and better and better at reducing it, but there's some level above which, or below which, we are not going to get. And so when you think about your margin, if you've got a 40% margin, but you've got a 25% operational inefficiency, you're making 15 points, which is not a lot of money to grow a business with. And so understanding what you, where your margin is, what your inefficiency is, and they're easily measured, and then building a model around how to reduce inefficiency and increase your margin is critical to your success and, and, to, and to my success. Um, the next is lack of capital, the lifeblood of any company. The benefit of the previous icon is that the, the value of a performa is that it not only measures whether you have a positive or a minus at the end of each of those months, but as you add them up, this plus, plus this plus, plus this plus, minus this you know, deficit, plus this plus, plus, it tells you in 12 months whether you've made money, but it also tells you over a two-year period where you're going to need capital. And if you have these kinds of tools, when I've gone to a bank, they care about three things in a business plan. They care whether or not, first, I have numbers that show that I actually know what I'm doing. 
that I have a strategic marketing plan that is defensible, understandable, logical, and executable, and that I have a team capable of executing it. Everything else is fluff. So if I show up in front of a banker and I show him that I've got a team that can execute it, we have a track record, a track record of execution, here's our strategic marketing plan, and here are the numbers justifying not only that we can make money, but we can pay back the loan that we're asking for, and here's the use of the loan, you exponentially increase your probability of getting a loan from a traditional bank. That's assuming you're making a profit and your books look good. The rest of us go to friends and family and beg. <laughs> But the reason I, I mentioned lack of capital being a big issue is that, again, we mistake, we mistake positive cash flow for profit, and it's not. And that's a fatal mistake. The next item is operations, where we overpromise and, and underdeliver, And that's really a function of being able to deliver the things you promise to somebody at a price that you can afford to deliver to, to them uh, you know, at. That, that, that we've entered into that economic exchange where your pain is greater than my price, and my price gives me a margin. And he happens to be this 25-year-old and that becomes an evangelical uh, you know, owner of my client, or of my product, and goes out and tells all of his friends, by the way, dude, come on, let's wear the badge, the badge of honor. It's not a sling anymore. It's something other than a sling, which you have on, clearly. I'd rather not. So, um, now operations is important because the focus of operations is to squeeze cost out of, out of everything that you, that you produce, whether it's a service or whether it's a product. Um, the, the, again, the, there's, a, the, there's an addiction to that part of it. Many of us get really, really focused on cutting costs instead of generating top-line revenue. I can tell you that 80% of the problems that every company has can be solved more easily by increasing top-line revenue than by cutting bottom-line expenses. All the bottom line expenses is addictive because you see such an immediate result. But often we'll cut bone and sinew and capacity, cap important capability, rather than spend our time and resources trying to increase revenue. So again, the two things that we focus on at the SBDC is first, helping you increase, finding ways to increase your revenue. And it's, again, the wax on and wax off. Make sure you understand what market you're in, what problem you're solving, how you're solving unique with the value proposition, that they have a margin, that you follow the principles of marketing, which includes you know, identify the problem, amplify the problem, solve the problem, and that there are elements like, for example, awareness. People can't buy your product if they don't know about it. So first, the first step of marketing is awareness. Second step of marketing is building confidence. They have to have confidence in you before they buy. We're herd animals. We only do what everybody else does. The third is try it, then buy it, then repeat it. And again, that there's science, there's there's social, there's human science behind all this. It's it's, it's all, it's all that, that behavioral science stuff that we may not have paid attention to. But we are as animals are wired to behave a certain way. And if you don't honor the science behind how we behave as an animal, you can put yourself up. And that that's not even on here. So, like I say, this is not the definitive list. It's just seven. And again, there's a if you're starting up for the first time. There's a pre-go-to-market piece where you actually test what you have, then you refine your offering, and then you reduce cost. And, and that, those are the three things under, under Section 5. The next one is having the wrong people on the bus. Now, Jim Collins is, a, is an author many of you may be familiar with, maybe by the title of his books rather than his name, Good to Great or Built to Last. If you haven't read those, they're, 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 they're worth reading. His, his um, analogies are terrible. Hedgehog concept, I mean, it's, you don't relate well to them, but the principles behind them are solid. And one of the things he says is that for, success, for companies to succeed, they have to get the right people on the bus and the right seat on the bus. And one of the most important things that we can do as business owners is make sure that we populate ourselves with people with the brand DNA in them. And that means you have to understand what your brand DNA is. And it's not like the shirt that he has on that has the badge on it. Brand is not the badge. Brand is what compels him to, do, to go out and to assess the cost of the damage to someone's home that is not driven by money. And when a, an organization goes through a branding exercise, it's really like going to those you know, beating drums and you know, strumming. It's, it's a very intimate experience. But when you get there, there's this aha moment. And when you get there and have that aha moment, you're now building on bedrock. Because if you understand your purpose, the reason that you go do what you do other than for earning a check, and that you understand the values that drive you, not aspirational, that are who you are, 
then you find the people that have that same purpose in their life and same values that not, again, not aspirational. Reynolds, Reynolds makes tobacco. Their <clears throat> purpose and their whole culture is around individual freedom. Now, why do you think Reynolds would be all about individual freedom? They make cigarettes. Mm -hmm. Right. choice to use it if you want. Exactly. So they're giving everybody the middle finger saying, we get to choose what we do. We're all about independence. That's how we justify killing people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, if you want to kill yourself, it's your choice and it's a God-given right. It's in the Constitution. You should be able to kill yourself by any means you'd like. And by the way, let us send you a cigarette. That might help. For the SBDC, when I joined, I was given a purpose that I was supposed to memorize. In fact, they read it and I was really sad that they did. Because it sounds awful. Did you hear that purpose? You know, build the fabric of the, you know, the, it's like we pulled that out of a Cracker Jack thing. It was like, really? I called, I called our, our boss and I said, Sherman, do I really have to memorize this? He said, well, tell me, why are you having a problem? I said, because it, it's crap. There, there's nothing emotive here. There's no brand. And you, and you said in the interview that one of the things you wanted me to do is help rebrand the SBDC. So are you serious about that or not? You said, yes, we're serious. So we went through a branding exercise as the SBDC. And it is worse than the most intense marriage counseling you will ever go through. Because finding your brand is about telling truth. And we don't like to tell truth because it makes us vulnerable. And when you get a bunch of strangers in a room telling truth to each other around something that you're going to hold each other accountable to, it's a frightening, really badass experience. It can be, anyway. And so I, the new guy on the block, am leading this exercise, and we have the most senior director in the state, 22 years there. We have the next senior, 20 years there, me, uh, four months, the director of the network, his assistant, and their admin going through this process for two and a half days. And we typed up 168 statements that got all the way down to, we pretend to work because they pretend to pay us. I mean, it was that, like, really? Yeah, nobody respects us, and we can't hire quality people because our pay sucks, and, and it was really wonderful. And, and you take all these, these statements, and then we distilled them over that long period of time down to, and I'll remember this forever, Jim Heron, the associate director of the, of the network, said, well, it sounds like what we do is we teach truth and change lives. It was like, oh, <laughs> you know, it was wonderful. And the oldest counselor, Beth, folded her arms and crossed her legs and said, that's not who I am. That makes me sound like some damn Mormon missionary, and I'm no damn Mormon missionary. <laughs> and Jalair, who was the, you know, the admin, stood up in this very wispy, and Jalair, you have to picture this, she, she dyes her hair flame red. She is, if not totally white, really close to porcelain. And she stands up with this wispy voice and says, no, Bev, that's just exactly who we are. <laughs> Bev quit two weeks later because... A good brand coalesces and draws to it the people that belong to it, the customers that belong to it, the people that are going to execute the brand. It brings them in, ma not, not magically, but very deliberately, and it repels those that don't belong. And so the only modification to that was that at, after sleeping on it, the next day we got up and said, how do we feel? And I, I felt uneasy about the statement that we teach truth and change lives because I can lead you to water. I can teach you truth, but you have to engage in it. And so we added the word help. So the purpose of the SBDC in the state of Utah is to, ch is to teach truth and help change lives. Now, what does it mean to teach you truth? Truth is measured by, does it increase your revenue, and does it help you gain access to capital? Anything else is a waste of your time. So immediately, Seven Habits, which we were certified to teach, gets tossed out the window, because what does Seven Habits do? Does it help you increase your revenue? Does it help you gain access to capital? Not really. We feel good. We talk about our personal you know, victories and our private victories, and we sharpen our saws together. But it does nothing to increase revenue. But we did then adopt the training called Four Disciplines, which is probably the only thing Covey ever taught that actually moved somebody's needle. And he borrowed that from a guy named Ram Sharam out of Harvard. And when I applied for disciplines to one of my companies, again, we went from 11% growth to 27% growth, compounded over six years, which meant we were doubling every three years, which is a terrifying and painful experience. And anybody here would think, that should be wonderful. Try to cash flow that. It, I, I, I mean, everything I owned was hot. That's how I became this millionaire in debt. 
it, it turned out much better at the other end of that. But back to, back to what we're talking about, getting the right people on the bus, getting the wrong people off. When you understand what your brand is, you need to make sure that the people you hire, there's a little DNA symbol in there. It's kind of cute. You need to make sure they have that DNA in them. And it has nothing to do with them being, you know, <coughs> white bred Mennonites from Utah, which you all are, uh, but, uh, but, but, you know, being Jewish and being African and being female and being every diversity you can have, except that they have that purpose. I love to teach truth and I love to help change lives. Boy, there are lots of people around the earth that don't look like me or speak like me or act like me that would belong at the SBDC as that purpose in their life. And the beauty of diversity is that I get rich, powerful, divergent answers to big problems because they bring a perspective that isn't common. Uh, is anybody here familiar with the value of binoculars versus monoculars? What, what is the value of binocular vision versus monocular vision? Field of view. Field of view and depth of view. It's a, it provides a range. If you remember those old World War II films where these guys were looking through, binocular, through, through uh, uh, opticals that had these you know, big lenses that were like feet apart. And the reason they're feet apart is the further they're apart, the further they can give you accurate range for launching artillery and hitting a target. And so the value of diversity in your management team is that it's a binocular vision instead of monocular. And you see problems with more depth and more field of vision. And so getting the right people that have that DNA in, in them, native to their nature, is, is, in, is critical. And getting as, many diver as much diversity as you can possibly find in, in this valley, I find it's pretty hard. But, you know, you can work at it. Uh, but that's the value of diversity. And then last is um, no financial vision. And the no financial vision is, is because we have anxiety around numbers. If you don't get familiar with something like a performa, you know, all a performa does is, give, is frame problems, kind of like when, when, we, when I ask you, where do these kids that break their arms that want to wear it as a badge of honor rather than just a heel live? We frame the question in such a way that anybody in this room can answer that question intelligently, right? I mean, you intuitively know, oh, I go to the extreme sports place and I put a banner up, I go to the social media sites that they visit and I, you know, advertise there. Why would we advertise, you know, at, at AARP? I mean, I can convince you that there's tons of readership there, right? But would you really think that your money spent in a print ad in an AARP monthly magazine is as powerful as the same print ad in, you know, snowboard extreme you know, or, or advertising in the next, is, does Wilson even make, uh, who, who's the big ski, he makes it every year, big ski, ski movie? Miller. Warren, Warren, Warren Miller. Yeah. yeah, do a Warren Miller ad there, right? That's where you're going to find your audience. And so when we think about going out of business and we think about tools that, that we wished we had, the financial perspective and long distance vision that comes from understanding Performa is another area where most businesses fail, is they get so involved in the, what we call keep the joint running, that they don't do the things necessary to keep looking over the horizon. Uh, on the first part where you plant your flag, the other image that goes with that is a prairie dog. Because once you've planted your flag, you need to get in the ground and dig and do your work and then stand back up and look over the horizon to see who's encroaching on your hole and about to eat you alive. Because as soon as you demonstrate there's money to be made in a particular field of endeavor, what's gonna, what do you do? You may as well be shouting, hey, come on over here, guys, I found gold. Come mine with me. Mm -hmm. And so the other thing you're going to be doing is with this, with binoculars, is understanding, one, how, what, what capital you need, since that's the lifeblood, and two, refining your offering constantly. Because like framing the question around marketing, a performance spreadsheet gives you financial binoculars that let you look over the horizon. And think of it like, a, this is kind of a gruesome example, but it's a really good one. If you were a sniper, and I were to hand you a 50 caliber sniper rifle, and I put up a target 500 yards away, how many here in this room could hit a target with a decent scope at 500 yards? Every, yeah, but, but how, how many here, with, with one hour training at your hands, could, could competently hit that target? Let's move it into 200 yards. 200 yards. What percentage of us could hit it? 
<laughs> yeah, probably probably 80% of us could hit that target within the 10th shot. Okay, you move the target out to 400 yards, and the probability maybe drops to 70%. You move it out to 1,000 yards, and it drops down to 40%. You move it out to 2,000 yards, <laughs> and the probability that even you can hit it drops dramatically, but what are the considerations that go into calculating whether or not you're going to get your bullet out of the chamber, through the barrel, through the air, and all of its variables, and the, the Borealis effect, which is the, the rotation of the earth, and everything else that goes into getting that, that piece of metal to hit the target, what's your probability of, of hitting it at 2,000 yards? Minimal. But if you make your gun stationary and you understand your instruments, you understand the barometric pressure, you understand uh, you have good field of view, you understand uh, you know, where you are in the latitude of the earth, you have a calculator that, that takes in the Borealis effect, and you understand the wind variation between you and the target, what have you done to the probability of hitting that sheet of metal? way up. And that's what Performa spreadsheets do, is that over time they become really well-tuned representations of how you make your money. How do I hit my target? How do I hit my short-term stuff so that I can actually make long-term projections that I have confidence that I can hit? I mean, right now, the best example of how most of us run our business is how most of us run our social media campaigns. How many here have a social media campaign? And how many here with a social media campaign make t most of their money from it? Well, you're a consultant in the area, right? <laughs> but, not, but, waiting for that. But, but you know most of your clients don't, no, no. right? <clears throat> but is it an important part of the whole offering? Very important. Okay, remember the five things that, that happen before you become a repeat customer? What's the first one? Before you can buy my service or buy my product, what do you have to be aware of it? And that's all social media can do. So as part of the instruments, it's a rough cut. It says, in general, I need to be heading that direction. The fine-tuning, the actual, before you actually take that breath and purse it out through, you know, through your lips and make sure you're doing it with your heartbeat and everything else and squeeze instead of jerk the trigger to get in, you know, that, the mechanic working for you, uh, the, the mechanics and proper execution working for you, requires a whole variety of variables. And it's a complete package. And when we think about running a business, the complete package really revolves around seven activities. Three of them are, are the top of this, and, and they're in this here, so these aren't disparate. And, and I, I made them primary colors because I do them all, all the time with my businesses. And it's plant my flag, understand how I make my money, and, and, the, and that awareness, confidence, try, buy, repeat is here. That produces my, my contribution margin that goes then through my binocular tool called the Performa. And I do those all the time. The other four items that I do are episodic adventures. The first is this branding thing. I don't brand every time. If I brand right, I probably don't ever change my purpose. I might change how it looks visually, graphically, but I don't change my purpose. I don't change my, my values. I may change my vision, which is a monetary expression of the first two. Uh, hiring people actually falls under, HR falls under the branding piece because you want to make sure they have that DNA in them. The next item is operations. And you deal with operations like we did when you bought close with this young lady who is probably six, five. five. Yeah. So, so when he goes to buy clothes for his five-year-old, does he go to the five-year-old section to buy five-year-old clothes for her? No, he probably goes to the six-year-old section because she's growing like a weed right now. And to buy five-year-old clothes for this five-year-old girl is, is really a waste of cash. And operations is the same thing. We buy a system or we, we adopt a system that we grow into and then we grow out of. Again, episodically, we deal with it. On the other item, if you need money, if you need to borrow money every month, you're not in business. You're dying. If you're a healthy business, you need money episodically. And so understanding how much you need, what the cheapest money is, and how to gain easy access to it is an episodic adventure. And then last is what we call legal launch. And, in legal launch, it's all the things like, what business formation am I? If you're going to do an IPO, uh, initial public offering, you've got to be a C corp. You have to have two years of auditable, you know, audited books. How do I position myself if, if that's ultimately where I'm headed? You know, beginning with the end in mind. How do I get myself there? Um, you know, do, do you have intellectual property that needs to be protected? What business formation do provides protection, liability protection for my personal assets? What doesn't? 
Do I have a business valuation or contracts that need to be signed for a buy-sell agreement? All that falls under that, set, that, that last section. And there is nothing I've ever done as a business owner that doesn't follow one, uh, under one of them. But I never stop marketing, and I never lose sight of how I make my money. And anybody that does will make a fatal mistake and put themselves out of business in one of seven creative ways, and we'll come up with more creative the next time we talk about it. Any questions? Because that's the sum I think I made it in 28 minutes. That was good. So. That's good. You're still, it's almost done. Good. There's time for two questions. <laughs> no. It's your or, chance. Okay, or none. <laughs> now, how many here have ever heard of the SBDC? Wow, more than me. Paul? I was going to ask, uh, you said 80% of the problems can be solved by more revenue. What are the, what are the other 20% of the problems? For, for by increased top end, you said, as opposed, oh, as opposed yeah. to... Yeah, I mean, it, it, each issue is typically is a cash flow issue. You know, how do I, how do I put more, how do I put more, um, how do I get more PP&E, property, plant, and equipment? It's top line revenue. So or how is it cash. by top line revenue is my question. Then. Oh, it's gross revenue. Where do you find more people that need that have broken arms that are willing to buy the sling? Okay. Now, once you you get that whatever that that this is fifty dollars, let's say that I'm selling the sling for, but because it's graphically treated, it's going to be eighty dollars because people are willing to pay the extra premium because of the bad. <clears throat> but top line revenue is however many sales I make times eighty is my top line revenue before it flows through my expenses. And what you need to make sure is that your top the cost of producing that revenue is less than the revenue you're getting. I, I knew I knew that part. I just meant you said uh, eighty percent of the of the company's problems would be solved by top line revenue. By increasing top line revenue. And what would the other twenty percent that wouldn't be solved? Those are typically operational solutions. So people P yeah. hiring yeah. issues. Those Tip, yeah. Kind of I've always said that I could make a whole lot of money if I didn't have to deal with, with employees okay. and if I didn't have to deal with clients. <laughs> eliminate both of those headaches, I can make more money. And the rest of my time is around dealing with those issues operationally, uh, you know, HR, IT issues, I mean, all the infrastructure, the stuff that keeps the joint running while I'm doing these two things all day long. Okay, thank you. But, but back to the, you know, what the lifeblood is, capital, for example. If I'm going to go sit down in front of this gentleman from Chase whose name I've forgotten. Chris. Just, Chris, if I'm going to sit down in front of Chris, what Chris cares about is, what do your revenues look like? What are your sales? I mean, that's the first thing out of his mouth. What are your annual sales? And then he gets down, okay, which is a top line revenue question. That, that tells him a whole variety of things. When you tell him where you sit in the pantheon of, revenue, of the revenue landscape, it immediately tells him what, what size of business you are. And then the next question is, how much money did you make? What was your bottom line profit? What were your net profits? And now, you know, from a from a small business standpoint, making a profit isn't necessarily a good thing because I pay taxes on it, everything that's a profit, right? So I can sit with him and explain my books and say, well, here are the things that I did to minimize my taxes. And we work through, again, back to, you know, what is the value of a performance that I can show him where we made, you know, we, we made deliberate investments in the business that we might not have and we don't anticipate in the future and explain that picture financially in a way that, qualifies me for cash. But if I don't have top revenue flowing through that performa, there's not going to be anything positive at the bottom. That's interesting because, you know, we learn in our business classes that uh, you increase the sales by a dollar and 10% goes to your bottom line, but you decrease your expenses by a dollar and a dollar goes to your bottom line. Right. And that's why they're professors and have never run a business. At the end of the day, Top line revenue solves more of your problems than bottom line because again it's addictive because you see that dollar. But how much how much can you cut out of a hundred thousand dollars of, ex of expenses? A hundred thousand dollars. That's the limit of your benefit of a dollar for dollar benefit. You follow? But if I spend fifty thousand dollars on on a, a marketing campaign that returns two X or three X or four X or five X, and we learn, we pray to those things, we put them in order of their impact. I can spend a dollar on marketing and it produces three dollars, or four dollars, or five dollars. Where my the total benefit to me in cutting expenses is limited to my expenses. That's the full range of the impact of doing that. But getting smart about understanding that 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 dollar saved invested in marketing 
should be producing something X, not dollar for dollar. In fact, the ratio is if you're not getting 3X return in your marketing dollars, you're trading dollars for cash because most of us have, you're just trading dollars at, at, at two for one. Because most of us have keystone pricing, which is if I cost me a dollar, I charge two. That's keystone pricing. And so if you've got a 50%, you know, you've got a keystone model, then for every dollar you take in, you send, you know, you, you get two dollars back, well, a dollar goes to your supplier. So you've given a dollar, you've got two back, but a dollar went to a supplier, so you get your dollar back. You make profit when you're above that ratio. And so when you, when you learn that the, you've got to do this marketing thing where I get more than just a two dollars back for every dollar I put into marketing, my sling, I start making a profit. And again, small business owners that don't begin to learn those shortcuts, you know, that, that you just have those formulas in your head, you put yourself out of business because you'll focus on saving a dollar. Look, I cut a dollar, I saved a dollar. And how far does that get you? Crippled and unable to, to operate because we cut our capacity. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Other questions? Well, thank you. Great audience. Yeah. If any of you would like to go through a pro forma process or anything like that, um, I'll give you my card and you can schedule an appointment. You can come in and we can walk your business through through a year of your pro forma, even two years of throw your business on on a spreadsheet. So yeah. each one is custom built because your businesses are so unique, and, and by building it, you learn about your business. You you begin to answer the questions. For those of us again that. They get a pit in our stomach around that. This is a way to overcome that anxiety. And we can figure out your margins and everything for you. Okay. So, so while we're on, on your phones, how, what's the best way for these businesses to contact you, Sean? Uh, I can give you my card right now. Um, it has my all my contact information. Okay. That's probably the best way. All right. You can e email me or call me. Great. Yeah. So don't run off too fast. Make sure you yeah. get the yeah, time. Yeah, I actually have a pocket full. Well, and again, I'll grab thanks so much, Winthrop. Oh, what a wealth here. of experience and knowledge. And well, I, 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 love, I, mean, I, I get passionate about, about doing this because I, I know emotively what you're going through. And, um, and having been there, I wished I'd had the resource that we offer uh, because this came from those sleepless nights. How do I solve this? And, and it's a collage of other people's better thinking. This is, I didn't come off a mountain with tablets. It, 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 I'll, you know, I cite, you know, there are probably 60 authors <laughs> whose, whose blood, sweat, and tears went into helping us develop this. So. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate you giving your time. Yeah. And I uh, want to acknowledge again uh, uh, Sean and uh, what you do for us here at the Business Resource Center, your services and availability. And I'm sure we'd be glad to talk to anyone who calls. I'd be happy to talk to all of you. And, uh, oh. and a huge resource for the businesses and, and the economy. Uh, making this happen, you're, you're a tremendous resource to have here in the city. Glad to have you. Thanks for all you do for us. And uh, well, we had some others that come in that didn't get to introduce themselves. Uh, um. Lauren, I'm going to put you on the spot so everybody <laughs> knows who you are. Hi. <laughs> I'm Lauren. Um, what do you oh, we talked a little about who you are and what, what, what your business is. Um, my business is Lambert Cosmetics, a natural and organic makeup and skincare company. Awesome. So, yeah. Wonderful. Glad to have you here. My name is Rich. Uh, some of you already know me there. I own uh, Lock and Load Guns and Gear here in Eagle Mountain. Uh, we're home based uh, firearms and uh, gun accessory dealer. So um, we're actually uh, in the process. Uh, we just started uh, financing for guns. Um, that's something new that we've just added. Uh, no credit checks. And uh, we're working with a company out of Sarasota, Florida to make that happen. So. Uh, we're kind of excited about that. Um, hopefully, we have it up going here by the end of this week. Um, and uh, I already got about 15 customers already wanting to finance um, through Texas and a few other places that we're, we've kind of spread out to. Uh, not only here in Utah, we're branching out, so trying to give buds guns and grab a gun and run for their money. So, okay. and uh, yeah. we're going to be offering training here. Uh, as soon as my I heal from my <coughs> surgery here, so. Thanks, Rich. We have a couple more out there, uh, Dustin and Judy. Do you want to oh, come well. in? And oh, I'll, keep I'll come in just really quickly. And I'll you, but, um, Dustin Bassett, and my wife and I run the Family Do Lots. It's a family oh. management system to help parents make parenting easier and motivate children. It's kind of a fun system. 
Um, yeah, we've been doing that about two years. Sounds very interesting. Let's learn a little more about it. I'm glad you're here. And, uh, Judy, did you want to introduce yourself? It's Jody. Jody, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I need to put my glasses on. Um, I don't know. Why do you want me to say <laughs> Well, why don't you tell us about your businesses? Okay, so I just opened up, um, I guess it's kind of just still out of my home, but we do Silver Apple Boutique, which is um, a women's clothing line. Oh. And actually, I had quite a few customers today. That's why I was late. But um, we're just trying to get the word out that there's women's clothing so we don't have to drive all the way to Provo or Pleasant Grove or a little closer to home. Great. Great. Glad you're here. I you made it. And if, uh, now, with Rope to Relive, just a tremendous amount of information tonight. I couldn't soak it all in at once. I'm going to be looking forward to the video once it comes out. Now, it will be posted, and if you're not on our mailing list already, uh, get with me. Let's get your email address down and make sure that you're aware of it so that when the video is online, we'll send out a uh, notification. Can go and review there. So. That's uh, emcbusinessforum.org? Embusiness.org? Em em yeah, embusiness.org is our website. <coughs> so. We'll get an email out to you. So if you want to make sure you're on our email list, we can keep updates. So anyway, don't run off if you don't have to. Uh, we can yeah. uh, linger and visit. To, we'll, we can call a meeting closed, I guess. Oh, well, you know, the, the whole kind of, one of the large purpose of this is when we seem to connect all you guys together, there's a great synergy that tends to happen. Yeah. Um, all these businesses working together. I mean, business is growing in Eagle Mountain, and we're really trying to facilitate that that growth. So, you know, take some time and get to know each other because it's amazing the type of resources you can gain from each other, just from your your knowledge and your experience. This really is just a melting pot of of information. So, take some time and get to know each other, and you know, there's probably a lot of ways you can benefit each other, help each other out, and benefit each other. So. Good deal. Thank you for coming. And we look forward to having a. The meeting next month too, so we'll get you information on what the topic will be in a, in a time and location. So, all right. And I'll be out here with my cards. So. Yeah.